Hi there. So have you guys, uh, you guys all had lunch yet? Kind of. Well, those of you who did, which did you have? Pizza Hut, KFC, or McDonald's? <laughs> I'm at the Pizza Hut. I'm at the Taco Bell. I'm at the combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess we can, uh, we're, we're on time, right? We can get started, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, this is uh, Convention Photography, Photography 101, how to get that shot and make it look easy. Um, now, uh, disclaimer, we are not professional photographers. We don't even play them on TV, but um, we are avid convention photographers and... Well, over the years, we've learned a thing or two, and these are the tips and techniques that we have found to um, help you get that shot. Actually, uh, I have a, an associate's degree in photojournalism. However, this was back during the old days of film. Remember film? 35 millimeter? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's a brand new world. Digital is completely brand new. Oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's made photography accessible and, and a lot easier. So, before we go any further, write this URL down, otakunopodcast.com slash photo. Um, it's not up yet. I was literally up until 3 a.m. this morning working on these slides, so I didn't have a chance to update the website. But it's probably t tonight or maybe tomorrow, I'll go through and update the website with all of the links to the products and, and that I mentioned, as well as you know, uh, tips and techniques, you know, links to articles that I find useful. So in a couple days, check this URL, and you'll find everything that we talk about there. So you don't need to furiously copy down notes or anything. Um, so, what the program guide didn't tell you, however, is that we have swag today. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. But you're going to have to you're going to have to work for it. Um, and the what, what I thought uh, as appropriate is we should play uh, name the anime and talking about and I went through and scoured my brain for all the anime that I could find uh, with scenes of people using cameras in it. So, well, before we started, let's just get some terminology straight. There's really two main types of digital cameras. There's the point and shoot, which is the guy on the left. Basic, simple, you know, no-brainer, just push the button and it shoots. Um, and there's the digital SLR on the right, the big clunky things with the detachable lenses uh, with like over 9,000 buttons on them. Now, there is actually a third type of camera called the hybrid camera, which is the guy sort of in the bottom in the middle. But I don't really like this type of camera. As you can, as, as you can tell by the picture, they look a lot like DSLRs, but they're not in that the lenses aren't interchangeable and they don't have as many you know, settings as DSLRs. So really, what's the point of, I don't see the point of those because you're losing the convenience and portability of a point and shoot and not really gaining very many features that a, DSL, a DSLR would have. So um, as far as I'm concerned, they don't exist. <laughs> so now that we got that out of the way, now it's time to play Name That Anime. Uh, Bingo, who's the first one? Yeah, someone, will have to, someone will have to be the... Uh, the official. Uh, okay, I'll. I'll, I'll um, well, actually, I think the, uh, the 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 correct answer came from the the, the techies here, so uh, uh, they they don't count. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Can we just yell it out, or you guys just like? Uh, you you raise your hand. Raise your I, hand. I will I will I will look. Thank you. Uh, so unfortunately. Shall uh, we shall I call that one a wash for then? Yes. Let's All right. Call it that was the practice round. <laughs> Okay, so... Are you going to tell us what anime it was? It was K-On. <laughs> so, what are the, the typical photo, um, lighting scenarios that you typically see at a convention? Oh, this lady back here actually got it. <laughs> oh, wow. This, this lady back here actually said K-On. She just said it very quietly. Well, then she gets a prize. <laughs> okay, we've got some lovely... Um, 
thingies, yes. Someone will have to be the official, the official gift hander outer. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll. Love, you get a lovely um, lens rental lens cleaning cloth, which are extremely useful. Not only can they clean lenses, but they can also clean eyeglasses, um, anything, if cell phone, um, cell phone screens, laptop screens. So, what? What are the typical convention photography scenarios that we see? Um, there's the, your typical outdoor photo shoot. There's your typical indoor scenario, such as a panel room like the one we're in right now, or your typical dealer's room or hall cosplay. And there's masquerade, the theater lighting, that sort of thing. So let's start with outdoor photography. You got a lot of light, and you might think this is a good thing. Well, actually, it's not. The problem with it is the light is very directional, and it tends to really, really um, make shadows horrible. And let's just, I mean, let's face it, you know, we n none of us get any enough sleep at conventions, so especially by day three or day four, we're all con zombies. We got those, that hollows, the hollows under the eyes, and you know, that, it does not, it's not very flattering. And even if we're talking, let's talk costumes. You know, let's say you have a costume with various dangly bits on, you know, little little uh, uh, ornamentation on it. You know, those can cast uh, nasty, harsh shadows as well. So the trick with outdoor photography is managing your light and managing your shadows. Um, the solution is an easy one: find a shady spot. I mean, literally, this is the solution. This is the the uh, tip that that most photo classes, you know, kind of drill into you from day one. Find a shady spot, um, you know, uh, under a tree, um, by a wall, basically it's somewhere where you can soften the light. You know, not have the direct light beating down on you. Now, if you happen to be taking pictures on a cloudy, overcast day, it's perfect because. The, the clouds and the, the fog or whatever acts as a natural softbox. It really softens the light, makes it look awesome. The only problem with that, though, is nobody wants to see a gray sky. So the trick there is you want to minimize the amount of sky uh, that's visible in your picture. So shoot against, you know, shoot someone against a building or, you know, against some scenery. Basically, uh, you know, to sort of tilt the camera down so that there's as little light or as little sky as possible. Another trick you can use is a reflector. And this, unfortunately, will require you to have an assistant, um, or you can ma really make someone stay in, and, uh, and make them feel important. Just you know, find some random person and say, hey, can you help me out with this? To you'll totally make their day. Um, and basically what a reflector is, is it's a large thingy. Pop, they pop right open, and um, they literally ref it literally reflects light. So let's say um, the sun is over here, so that would ca cast shadows on this side. So then I sort of angle the reflector like this to bounce light back and fill in the shadows. Um, basically, kind of play around with it until you get something that looks good. Um, now, if you don't have a reflector handy. <coughs> and you are at a convention that allows signs, find someone with a white sign, flip it around, and use the back side of it. That's a great do-it-yourself reflector. Or even, if you're doing a close-up on someone's face, um, have them hold a white sheet of paper um, out, of, out of the frame of the camera. That, you don't even need an assistant for that. And, that, that's, just perf that, and that's perfect if you're just doing close-ups. Yes, and also uh, on that reflector, the back side of it is useful for shading. You know, it, uh, it, it can actually cut light. So both sides of this, uh, of this is useful. Yes, it's two, two, two tools in one. <laughs> Act now and receive a free special gift. 
the, another technique you can use is fill flash. Um, many people think, oh, flash, you only use that indoors. No, um, you can, uh, there's many cases where you actually want to use the flash outdoors. And what that does is, again, it's an extra source of light to help fill in the shadows. Um, look in your camera's uh, manual or on your, on your camera setting dials. Even many point, cheap point and shoot cameras now have a, a fill flash setting. Yes. And, Basically, that'll uh, this, uh, this is a uh, cheap Econo. Uh, it's Nikon, but it's inexpensive Nikon, and it does have a fill-in uh, flash capability. Just so you know, this is a hundred-dollar camera. Yes, ma'am. Um, does the fill flash have a different effect than normal, like indoor flash? Because I know with normal ones, if you're wearing a wig, it makes it look really shiny and plasticky. Does that have the same effect? For, for outdoors, the fill flash is not as powerful as the natural light, so it's just used for, just, just, um, it's just powerful enough to fill in the, the shadows, so it shouldn't affect, um, um, affect uh, wigs and such like that. Yes, because you have the, the, a very big key light, which is up there, and we're orbiting around it. It's called the sun. Yes? So fill flash is different. Name that anime. Oh, uh, uh, let's, uh, let's, 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 let's do this again. I, Sorry. I was, uh, he was asking if fill flash was the same as regular flash, and I didn't hear the answer. I'm not sure if everybody else did. Uh, yeah, fill flash uh, is basically the same as regular flash, except you are using it in a different way. You're, you're basically uh, using it as a second light because you have this really big honking key light. And that's AKA, there to, to, to fix AKA it. AKA the sun. Yes. And, uh, so I don't setting. have a setting as fill flash. I, I just have regular flash. Is that the same? That's good enough, yes. That's good enough. Okay. okay, now let's play Name That Anime. Okay, you. Yeah, on my hand. Lucky start. Awesome. Lens Reynolds luggage tag. Okay. So we'll have to keep different people to go through. Okay. 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 Okay and dealer's room. This is really bad lighting, and it's, var it's varied. Um, sometimes you have incandescent light bulbs, sometimes you have fluorescent light, sometimes you have both, and sometimes you have multicolored light, like if you're in a dealer's hall booth, um, you know, some of the booths have you know, that funky multicolored lighting, and that can really throw off your picture. Also, for example, um, in a room like this, you may not necessarily have the best position. You know, those of you in row one are lucky, but what if you're, you know, way back in the boonies? The trick here is to keep the camera steady. Um, and this is, is just, you know, just, there's several ways of doing that, and we'll cover, cover some of those. You also want to, for example, in a, in a crowded dealer's room, you want to try and minimize the background because the background, a busy background, can really uh, take away from you know from the impact of your subject. And please don't be that guy or that girl, you know, the person who blocks the hallways, you know, taking pictures. Please, at least have some common courtesy. You know, try and you know get them to kind of move off to the side and stuff. Um, you know, if you're if you're pl blocking the aisles, it can cause accidents, and it's it's just not pretty. And also, flash is generally speaking not a, it doesn't work at all, um, especially if you're way back in the boonies, and a lot of times it's not allowed. Make so. How do you make your subject stand out? Well, the easiest thing to do is to pick the best background. So you know, don't take a picture of somebody in front of you know the wall full of different manga covers. Um, get them to kind of move off to the side, maybe against a wall or against you know someone's booth that has you know a less busy background to it. Um, 
you could use a backdrop if you want, um, if you have to have one. Um, or, you know, sometimes you, you, you know, like I said, look around for a booth that has, you know, a fairly nondescript background. You can also use um, a trick uh, for blurring the background. And to do that, I'm missing one of my slides. Um, oh, no. So, blurring the background with a DSLR, it's really easy um, to do because of, like I said, the versatility of DSLRs. Um, the trick with that is you want a lens with an extremely, with as wide an aperture as possible. And we're going to talk more about, you know, these terminologies, aperture, shutter speed, and stuff later. Basically, aperture is the, the how wide open the, the lens hole is. That's the uh, ultimate um, non-techie description. Um, f-stop. Yes, f-stop. So you'll see a number like f1.8, f2.0. You want to get a lens with the lowest number um, of that. And take that, set your camera to the widest uh, aperture, stand as close as you can to your subject, and make sure that the subject is as far away from any background uh, elements as possible. And then you'll get this lovely, uh, what, what, we, what is called bokeh, or bokeh, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, it's a Japanese word, <laughs> um, where your subject is in clear focus and you have this lovely, creamy, blurry background. It's, it's fantastic, and it's one of those, you know, those those things where you, where you look in a photo magazine and go, ooh, you know. Now, doing this with a point and shoot is a little trickier, but it's not. It's definitely doable if you have the right circumstances. And for one thing, you need a point and shoot with an extremely wide zoom, you know, like a, a, a 6x or, or, or more, that sort of range. And what you do is you zoom your lens out to the farthest it'll go, and you stand as far away from your subject as you can. Uh, so, like I said, this is sometimes not possible, like in a, in a crowded dealer's room, you can't really do it. But if you have some control over the location, like you know, if you can, if you can take your subject over to some place with a lot more room and you know, set it up this way, great. Name the anime. Okay, the lady in the back. Uh... Got it in one. Okay. Mug. Yes, since you're all the way back there, come up and get your mug. I'm going to mug you. <laughs> By the way, who's providing this mug? Lensrentals.com, and we'll talk more about them later because they're a totally awesome uh, company. <laughs> Okay, sometimes you have no choice, you've just got a flash. Um, your lighting is really terrible, and you happen to be in a place where the flash is not frowned upon. We've all seen those flash pictures that look like, you know, bar shots where, you know, you're just, everyone, you're, you're, the face is like totally pale and like there's no background at all. Um, there's, you know, everything's totally washed out. Well, that's because, um, there's a way to do flash pictures without making them look too obviously like flash pictures. Um, the first trick is get the flash off the camera. And unfortunately, this is one thing where you need a DSLR for. Like I said before, DSLRs offer you a fantastic degree of um, flexibility, and they're really not that expensive anymore. You can get really decent uh, entry-level models for about $300, even less if, you, if you're willing to go used. Um, and they're really not as big and bulky as they used to be either. Um, this guy here is the Canon XS. It's the entry-level model. And it's, it's quite easy to carry. Hey, that's very light. It is. It really is. So get the flash off the camera. First way of doing that is using something called a sync cord, and that's that little curly thing on the left. It's basically a, a cord that plugs into the camera. One end plugs into the camera, and the other end plugs into the flash. And it's like one of those coiled cords so it can stretch. Um, 
The second way is using a remote flash trigger, um, which is the little weird looking box on the right. That's the Canon STE2. Um, Nikon cameras have this functionality built in. Um, but it's basically an infrared trigger, you know, just like your infrared remote control. It'll, when you press the, the shutter button on the camera, it'll send a signal to the flash unit and the flash will go off. There's also these kind of weird little radio control things called pocket wizards, but that, that's, we're, uh, if we go that route, we're, we're really straying into geek territory and you know, spend a lot of money territory, so we're, we're not going to go there. Um, but getting the flash off the camera is... That, you do that one thing and your flash pictures will be like 10 times better. Now the trick to that is, where's my flash, there it is. Hold your camera in your right hand and hold the flash in your left hand. Have it angling kind of down and across and instantly your, your pictures will be that much better. Sorry. It's literally as simple as that. Another thing you can do is to soften the light. Um, flash uh, light is very harsh, it's nasty. And if you soften it, you know, it, the effect will be fantastic. So um, you can get something like the thing on the left, which I have right here, it's a, um, a portable um, softbox. Basically, it's a kind of a opaque white material that really does a fantastic job at, at softening the harsh flashlight. They're really inexpensive. This one cost me, I think, $12. Um, it just literally attaches to your flash unit. Um, the one, on, the thingy on the right that looks like a, a, a light bulb with its head cut off, it's, the, it's called the Gary Fong Light Sphere. Kind of a similar concept. It's a bit more expensive, but um, wedding photographers swear by this thing. So there's, there's quite a few options uh, that you can use to soften the light. You can also get a, um, a diffuser, which is which is kind of which is kind of like a reflector like this, only it's made out of a, a transparent material, and you just basically fire the flash through it, and it also softens the light. But again, you need an assistant for that. Whereas with you know, whereas with something like this, you don't need any assistant. It's very hard to do that sort of thing with something like this. You're, you're basically stuck when, whenever you have to use the flash with deer caught in hell, it's kind of flash thing. Out. Exactly. You can also do what the fashion photographers do and use a ring flash. This is the one um, exception to the get the flash off the camera rule. The ring flash is basically a thing that goes around your lens and projects nice even light uh, directly along the lens path. This uh, fashion photographers swear by this, and it'll give you that wonderful, creamy uh, fashion look with that awesome, what's called catch light, you know, that little light reflecting off a person's eye. Um, this is the, you know, the, the look that we're trained to appreciate, you know, from reading all the fashion magazines. And it's also great for macro photography, so if you're like taking pictures of models or something, ring flashes are awesome. Or taking uh, pictures of figures or dolls. Exactly. Finally, look for photo shoot areas. Um, this was taken at Anime Los Angeles, a great uh, convention, and they actually have a room with light soft boxes and backgrounds and all sorts of cool photo geek stuff set up, uh, free for anyone to use. It's, it's, really, it's really awesome, and you can get some fantastic pictures this way. Um, a lot of conventions have them. Also, sometimes you might see somebody set up, you know, taking cosplay photography, uh, you know, for like a magazine or something, and, you know, they have all the setup, and if you ask really, really nicely, a lot of times they'll let you use their, their stuff. Let's say if you just want to take a picture of your friend's new costume or something, if, you, if you're really, really polite and ask them nicely, um, you know, a lot of times they'll just say, sure, go ahead. Or maybe they might even offer to take a picture for you, who knows? Although sometimes when they uh, offer to take the picture for you, they expect you to pay for it. So yeah, always, always uh, make sure you ask first. <laughs> okay, name the anime. You guys want a hint? You, uh, this guy was first here in the Oh. Classes. 
Okay, yes, this gentleman. You got it. All right. For no lens cloth. Lens cloth. Hey, I don't have a lens cloth. We have I I have some at home. <laughs> Theater. This is probably the most difficult situation of all, and uh, in in un, un, in most circumstances, this is the time when you need to pull out the big guns. This is the time when you need to really put that point and shoot away and consider a DSLR, because usually your lighting is really terrible in that your subjects are brightly lit by spotlights, but your background is pitch black. And most cameras, um, they basically want to make the scene as even lighting-wise as possible. So you get these really terrible exposures where the background is gray and the, so your subjects are totally washed out. Um, you also very rarely have good seating position, you know, usually far back in, you know, back in the cheap seats. And, they, you know, they always drum into your head, no flash photography. And besides, it does you absolutely no good whatsoever. Um, the, the light output of these things, you know, is, is only enough to go, you know, X feet, not like way across the, the, the Nokia theater. Um, and in speaking about the Nokia theater, um, I am so glad that they went, that they're back in the Nokia theater this year because it has stadium seating, which means the person's head in front of you is less likely to get in your way. Very, very hard to do uh, with a point of shoot. You, you might be able to get, get by if you're you know, reasonably close and you use some of the steadying techniques that we'll talk about in a bit. But with the DSLR, um, if, you, if you have the right gear, which we'll talk about in a bit, um, you can usually pull it off. So keeping it steady. Um, how do you keep it steady? Use your surroundings. Um, are you standing on the balcony? Well, there's a nice railing in front of you that would make a perfect place to you know, stabilize your camera or your lens. Um, are you leaning, you know, are you, are you way in back? Lean against the back wall. Um, lean against a post nearby. Um, use the back of a chair if the chair in front of you is empty. Heck, I've even asked people if I could rest my lens on their shoulder. Hey, it might be a good pickup line. Who knows? <laughs> there's also other thing. There's also things that creative uses for a camera strap. There's one um, that that I like called the death grip, which I'll show you a picture of in a bit in a little bit. You can also get a tripod, or a monopod, which is basically a one-legged tripod. Um, tripods, you'll have to check with your venue because a lot of them, a lot of venues do not allow tripods, but almost none of, almost no venues, dis, almost no venues forbid monopods. And monopods, you know, you might think, oh, it just has one leg, it's all wobbly and stuff. Believe it or not, it gives you just enough stabilization to pull off that shot. You can also use what I call tripod alternatives, which we'll talk about in a bit. So here's the death grip. Um, you can see, basically, he's twisted his camera strap around his wrist and, and anchored it uh, against his shoulder. It provides a fantastic degree of stability. If you have a uh, point-and-shoot with a wrist strap, you can, you, you can kind of do the same thing, just kind of wrap it tightly around your wrist. Um, other things you can do, keep your arms close to your body. So, so don't go all like this. Instead, go like this. See, I'm keeping my arms kind of compressed close to my chest. See, that, that just offers enough stability sometimes to get the shot. So, tripod, alter that with this. tripod alternatives. Um, there's this really weird thing that's suddenly become very popular called a string tripod. And it's extremely easy to make. You can probably make it for all of $5 in parts at the local hardware store. Um, basically, it's a um, kind of an eyelet um, with, 
that fits the little tripod screw. It fits, it fits the little tripod screw in the bottom, and then you tie a string around it, and then you step on the string, and you pull the camera taut against the string. So I don't have one here, but it would be like, let's say this is the string, so I'm stepping on the string, and I'm pulling it taut against it. And again, it's kind of similar to the way a monopod works. It gives you just enough stabilization to get that shot. There's also um, other things you can do. This, this is a gorilla pod. It's probably my, it's the photographer's best friend because it is multi-jointed. You can wrap it around a tree branch. You can wrap it around a chair, a chair back. You can wrap it around, um, I don't know, anything, um, a balcony railing. You can wrap it around your, your, your buddy's neck if he's really bothering you a lot. <laughs> It is like, you know, you can, if, you, if two hands are holding the camera, you can keep it more stable than just one. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, let's see. Other ghetto, uh, other tripod alternatives. <laughs> um, the, the guy on the left is called a steady pod. It's basically the same thing as the string tripod, except they make it for you and it looks a little less ghetto. Yeah. Now the thing in the middle is a bean bag. Um, and believe it or not, if you're shooting in a, let's say you're, you're outdoors, there's a rock, you know, that would have, would offer really good stability, but it's a rock, so it's all uneven and the camera doesn't really sit well on it. So this bean bag, kind of kind of makes it so that it gives you a more stable platform and you can buy them but you can also make them just get an old sock or something and fill it with navy beans yes, and f indeed. finally the thing on the right it's uh, called it's called the bottle cap tripod and again believe it or not it offers you just enough stability to um, get that shot and you know it's something that we really should be carrying with us you know you have to keep hydrated and all that so bottle cap tripod um, and again, you can, you can either make them or there are companies that sell them. I think they're like $10 or less. Let's, let's get geeky. Um, we've been talking about exposure, aperture, ISO, that sort of thing. So here's where, let's, here's, okay, but first, name the anime. Right over here. Sorry? Okay. Yeah, Anyone? Oh, come on, take a guess. Anyone? I've seen this. Uh, I mean, I've seen the anime. I know what it's about. Anyone? I mean, I can tell you what it's about. I don't have a name. Who would it be? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen this anime? Um, I'll, should, we give, should we give a hint? Yes, give a hint. All right. Um, it's the Japanese word for something we talked about in outdoor photography. You got it. Well, this guy was saying it before me. Okay, so. right here. Mug. Mug, come on up and. Oh. He really can't. Could someone up Oh, sure, 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 sure. Sola. S O L A. Fantastic enemy. You should check it out. Okay, so um, some of you, this is this will be like old hat, but you know, for some of you it isn't. So we're going to go through it. Basics of exposure. You know, exposure meaning um, getting the picture on the the film or the digital sensor you know, with the correct lighting, you know, the desired lighting, that sort of thing. And that consists of three elements. There's shutter speed, or how how fast, how much time the uh, digital sensor is exposed to the, to, the, uh, to the light. There's aperture, which again is you know, how wide or narrow the lens hole is. And finally, there's ISO, or, which is basically how sensitive um, your digital camera um, sensor is. So shutter speed. It's expressed as fractions of a second. So one over 250, um, 160th, 
Um, and for really long shutter speeds, you'll get like, you know, sometimes you have long exposures, uh, five second exposures. Um, if you're doing astronomy pictures, you can have like super long exposures, like, you know, 30 minutes or more. Um, however, if confusingly enough, cameras usually only, usually, um, express this as a whole number. So on the back of the camera you'll see 250. Well that's not 250 seconds, that's 1 250th of a second. So it's very confusing. And when you're going long exposures, like one second or more, then it usually has like the number one with a funny little mark that kind of looks like a quotation mark or something after it. So that's really, it's really confusing, but you know, once you figure it out, oh, it's actually one over whatever, unless it has that little funny mark at the end of it, then you're good to go. Um, what does shutter speed control? Well, it controls motion. Um, the sh if the shutter is open for a fraction of a second, you're basically freezing time. Um, but whereas if you leave the shutter open for a fairly long time, like 1 60th of a second, 1 15th of a second, you're actually going to be capturing some motion. So let's say you're, 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 wanna, you're taking a picture of me talking up here. Um, you, you don't want to a long shutter speed because then you'll capture the motion of my mouth and it'll be all blurry and weird and it'll look like something out of, out of a Japanese horror movie. <laughs> but let's say you're taking a picture of someone in masquerade, you know, swinging, you know, you're swinging their sword, you might want to go with like a 1 15th uh, uh, exposure or shutter speed, then you can get that cool motion of the sword swinging in the air, which is awesome. Motion blur. Motion blur, yes. Generally speaking, um, the kind of rule of thumb for eliminating motion, let's say you don't want uh, that motion blur. Generally speaking, the rule of thumb, um, and this also applies to a camera shake, because the longer you have the shutter open, the more chance that you're, you'll kind of jostle the camera and it'll make everything all blurry and weird. So the general rule of thumb is uh, as close to the inverse of your camera's focal length as possible. Uh, that's the, you know, how many millimeters your lens is. So. For a 50 millimeter lens, uh, you'll want to set your shutter speed to 1 50th or greater, so typically like 1 60th or something. And that is a good rule of thumb for avoiding um, uh, the chance of camera shake. So aperture. Um, again, how wide open or closed in the lens hole is, that controls how much light you let in um, to the digital camera. And that's expressed as an F number. And again, you know, like Michelle said, uh, F stop. That's the, uh, the geeky photogra photographer terminology for it. Um, so you'll see like F 1.8, F 2, F 2.8. Confusingly enough, however, um, since this is really the ratio of the diameter of the lens hole to the focal length, smaller numbers mean a bigger hole. So that's really... And conversely, bigger numbers mean a smaller hole. So it's, it's, it's bizarro land here. So once you get your, wrap your brain around that concept, it's pretty easy. And again, ap you know, aperture controls um, how much light you let into the camera, but it also controls depth of field, the bokeh, the, the blurriness that we talked about. And you can calculate this out. It's really scary math. Uh, really, if you want to calculate it out, there's... Um, programs. There's the websites, you know, that have like little little JavaScript programs that'll do it for you. You just type in what kind of lens you have and how how far you are away from the subject. It'll it'll tell you what you know what how far you need to, need to stand in order to get things in focus and out of focus and that sort of thing. Um, or you can just experiment. Um, try taking you know standing different lengths from your subject. Try setting different. Um, um, different apertures on your lens, and as you experiment, you'll kind of get a kind of make little you know benchmarks in your brain as to oh you know I'm standing X feet away I should set my lens to F whatever. Now if you want everything in focus, like let's say you know you you you're taking a picture of you know a whole 
group of uh, a whole crowd of cosplayers, you know, you want to make sure everything's in focus because you know you don't want the people in the back row to be all blurry and stuff. In general, if you set your aperture to f8 or above, so f8, f11, that's in general um, high enough to allow everything uh, to be in focus. ISO. Um, ISO is sort of an international standards uh, measurement of how sensitive something is to light. And back in the, uh, in the days of film, um, you'd have different films uh, with different ISO numbers. So an ISO 100 film was mainly used for landscapes, you know, out in the day. Whereas an ISO 400 film is used for like, you know, indoors with reasonably good light. And you'd have like ISO 800 or even higher for, you know, even lower light conditions. Now, in the film days, <laughs> you know, once, once you put a roll of film into the camera, you kind of have to shoot the, shoot the rest of it, you know, before you change film. So if, you, if you're walking from outdoors, indoors, you'd basically kind of forfeit the rest of that uh, roll of ISO 100 when you have it to change. Not so in the digital age, because um, in the digital age, what ISO is, is really, it's controlling the gain of the digital, digital camera sensor or its sensitivity. And that can be adjusted on the fly. The problem with that, though, is that the trade-off here is digital noise, little grainy bits in your picture. Um, typically, for most point-and-shoots, you can mainly maybe push it as high as 400. You know, even the cheaper point and shoots don't even offer this the setting at all. They kind of do it automatically for you. Um, but for DSLRs, they have much bigger image sensors. And the bigger the image sensor is, um, the more uh, the more light sensitive it is. So if you, you know, for a typical, typical DSLRs, even the low end ones can go up to at least 800, sometimes 1600. And the you know mid to high range DSLRs go even higher, 3200, 6400. You could practically take a picture in pitch darkness. It's awesome. So now, if you do have to push your ISO past the uh, the the, the uh, comfort zone, and you do end up with a picture with noise, all is not lost though. Um, there's some awesome noise processing algorithms these days. You'll lose a little bit of sharpness in your picture. Things will be a lot, you, things will be softer than if you had shot with a, you know, with a, a more in, in spec ISO, but at least you'll have the picture. And there's, and the, the software is available uh, for both PC and Mac. There's some great ones, Noise Ninja, a um, couple others, and it's relatively inexpensive. I think only about $100 or less. So um, that's, that's one way to go as well. Are these Photoshop plugins? Um, yes, Photoshop plugin. Noise Ninja is also a standalone program, but it's, a, but it's also a plugin for Photoshop uh, Aperture and I believe Lightroom as well. Name that anime. I'll give you a hint. It's set in um, pre World War II China. Shall I, uh, shall I give, give it, give it out, give it out? Another hint. Another hint. Um, okay. Um, I'll give you two words in the title. Night Raid. Okay, you? Someone in the back. Oh. You got it. Senkoku no Night Raid. Let's talk gear. Um, 
it's, it, this, this is the play, this is the geek's paradise here. And that's probably the reason why most of us got into photography is because we like to play with the shiny. Yes. So, lenses. Um, we're we're t sort of straying into DSLR territory here. Um, now, with most packages, you know, uh, where you get a camera body and a lens, you'll get what's called a kit lens. And that's usually uh, something along the lines of an 18 to 55 millimeter, which uh, is basically kind of medium wide angle to medium uh, telephoto or zoomed in, which is a decent working range for, for most uh for most purposes. The only problem is that these lenses have a really, uh, a relatively small aperture, um, usually f3.5 to 5.6. They're great, great lenses for outdoor photography, but once you get indoors, things start to fall down. Um, you, can, you might be able to pull it off with, with a flash, but um, what, what, what's the better thing to do is get yourself what we, what we in the biz call a fast 50. Um, 50 millimeter prime lens, prime lens meaning there's no zoom. Um, it's just, and because there's no zoom, the lenses are simpler to make, so they can make them, it's much easier to make a high quality lens. The, the Canon 50, which, I, which is both Canon and Nikon, and mo well, all of the DSLR companies have a 50 millimeter prime, and they're really inexpensive. The Canon one is about $80. It, it's really cheesy. It's made of plastic. We call it the disposable lens, but it takes amazingly good pictures. I mean, you, put, you pop this thing on, and you'll feel like a pro. You'll, you'll be turning out awesome pictures with that cool, blurred background. It's fantastic. And for 80 bucks, it's a really inexpensive you know, an investment. It's awesome. In the golden age of film uh, photojournalism, that was the lens that uh, photojournalists used. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, a gentleman named Henri Cartier-Bresson, who was very, very well known for his work with like life and time and so forth. He always had a 50 millimeter lens on his camera. He never used anything else. And uh, he, he always won, won awards, Pulitzer Prizes, so forth. And the thing with the 50 millimeter is because it can't zoom, it'll force you to learn to become a better photographer. Because since you can't zoom, you have to think more about how you're going to compose your shot. And it'll, it'll really make you a better photographer. Yes, indeed. Um, now, um, I told you about the 18 to 55 kit lens that most cameras come with. You can actually kind of upgrade that. You can get an 18 to 55. Um, with a wider open aperture, um, and both, oh, again, all the camera manufacturers have that. The Canon one is is really nice. It has uh, image stabilization, which is something that I didn't really talk about before. But basically, it's elect it's a sort of an electromechanical system to help you get a little extra stability. Um, it, it's not a miracle worker, but it'll definitely help. Um, and if you you know if you want to be able to zoom, you know. Having kind of upgrading your 18 your kit lens is a good idea. This the Canon 18 to 55 on the right here that go, that goes um, it's an aperture of f 2.8, which is just enough that you can get those um, good good shots in less favorable lighting conditions, and you can do the cool uh, black background blurring thing. Now you want to if now if you want to play with the big dogs you can get what's called the photojournalist special. And you, bet, and you better hope that you're flush with cash for this because this lens is gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Um, I believe the Canon variety goes for $2,000. But this lens is pure magic. Um, this, like I said, it's the photojournalist special. Um, you know, nine, you watch any big event, you know, a presidential inauguration, um, you know, a big sporting event, you'll see all the pros with this lens mounted on, or, or you know, whatever equivalent mounted on their camera. And again, you know, Canon, Nikon, Sony, all the camera manufacturers have the equivalent. It's basically, it goes from 70 to 200. So that's a fairly, a fairly uh, long telephoto to a very long telephoto. Um, and it gets you an aperture of 2.8, which again, lets in an awful lot of light. This is the lens that you need if you really want to be able to pull off shots in like a masquerade or a concert, that sort of thing. Um, yes, 
I was shooting a masquerade last night, and I was getting, I was, you know, I was getting the, the uh, I, I didn't have a chance to process my pictures yet because, like I said, I was up until 3 a.m. working on these slides, but I was getting some awesome shots. Um, Pam over there can attest to that. I showed her some of them. I mean, you'll see details that that um, you know. Remember, remember the uh, the judges were up say, up there saying, "Well, you can't see the details in this costume. You can with this lens. Believe me." Hey, it's me. <laughs> hey. <laughs> that was my costume. Oh wow! <laughs> and I happen to have one right here. It's. This, I mean, this thing, you, you put this thing on your camera, you will feel like a pro. I mean, guaranteed, you, you'll feel, um, you know, powerful and <laughs> really awesome. <laughs> yes, the, the lens of power. Okay, so, you know, $2,000, if, you, if, you, if you're a dentist or a doctor, maybe you can afford that, but... What if, you know, you're a poor anime fan like us? Well, oh, sorry, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Straps. No, no, but just go back and tell them you rented it. I rented it. Um, there's some great, uh, this is sort of going into the future a bit. Rent, renting gear is a great way to, um, you know, uh, to uh, if you if you for a special occasion it's something you you cannot possibly afford or maybe it's something you only you might only use once or twice a year renting is a great um, alter, a great uh, way to do that uh, and it's very cost effective. Lensrentals.com. Lensrentals.com, ladies and gentlemen, we're paying our bills now. So now let's talk straps. Um, the strap that comes with your camera sucks. I mean, there's no way around it. It's it it chokes you. It's it's uh, and of, and you know it, and let's face it, it has a big Canon logo on it. So you're not only you're advertising for them, you're also saying steal me. And also they just do not fit well. They slip off your shoulder. It's it's really. You know, I, I almost lost a camera once because the strap just fell right off my shoulder. Fortunately, I, I wasn't sleep depth at the time, so I had enough reflexes to catch it before it hit the pavement. So there's several ways to go. Um, the one on the left here is called an upstrap, and it's sort of the upgrade, upgraded to the uh, first upgrade, upgrade to the main, uh, the camera strap that came with your camera. You can see it has this really nice, wide um, rubber band that literally, it, you put it on your shoulder and it stays put. Um, whether you know you can be maybe you could have somebody with a with a cloud strife sword run into you and it'll stay put. The other alternative is getting something called a black rabbit, and I happen to have one right here. This is basically similar in concept to um, a rifle strap. It kind of goes across your body like the Chewbacca bandolier. But, so your camera kind of hangs at your hip, ready for use, and when you want to use it, you don't have you to make the sound effect, but it's cool. <laughs> but see, it, it has this cool little little buckle that slides along the strap, so you, can instant, so you can instant, yeah, it's the quick draw camera strap, it's awesome. Um, and this, I mean, it's very comfortable, I can walk around all day like this, and when I see that cool costume, <laughs> yeah. It's called the Black Rapid, um, and again, these are really cheap. They're about maybe uh, thirty to fifty dollars, and definitely a recommended upgrade from the the uh, cheesy strap that came with your camera. Bags and cases. I love bags and cases because let's face it, you got to schlep around all your stuff. Mm -hmm. um, now there are several ways to go. You can go the traditional photographer photo bag route. Um, that's kind of like the one on the left here. This is a bag from a company called Domkey. They're famous uh, famous for, for photo bags. This one I believe is the F5S. And the nice thing about this is, you know, it, it holds a camera and, and a couple of decent lenses, decent sized lenses, but it doesn't obviously scream camera bag. So. Um, 
You know, it's, and, and it's really comfortable to wear. You can also go the backpack route, the one in the middle there. That's a bag from um, Low Pro. It's the slingshot. And the nice thing about it is it has a strap that kind of goes oh, around. Uh, a gentleman over here has this very bag. Uh -huh. It's, it's a fantastic bag because it has a strap where you can like literally pull the bag right in front of you for instant access to your camera. Awesome. You can also go the, uh, the sort of rolling luggage route. The problem with that is that some, there are some conventions, some dealers' rooms that really frown upon rolling bags like that. Yep. And also, when you have a backpack, you gotta be careful because, well, I've like almost knocked entire display cases over if I kind of back up, uh, you know, inconsiderately. So you got to really be careful. Can I mention just one thing about that? If you're in a really crowded place where, you know, these are anime fans, everybody's pretty nice, but in the Las Vegas in the casino, I have something stolen out of my backpack. So they've got professional pickpockets. So if you're thinking about, like, you know, New York City or whatever, just get a little locked. Now, you might want to go the vest route, and what, and there's the quintessential geek vest company is Scotty Vest. Um, you look like a total tool wearing it, but, <laughs> but believe me, I mean, you, you can carry a whole crap ton of gear in, in very comfortable fashion. Um, yeah, actually, uh, maybe calling it geeky is not the term you want here, maybe you look very professional photographer. There you go. Yes. There you go. And if you're traveling by air, here's a neat trick. A vest does not count as a carry-on bag. So you can literally run it right through the, um, the, uh, the x-ray machine and it won't count against your carry-ons. So load it up with photo gear and you can still carry your laptop or whatever on with you. Yes, uh, this is uh, one of the major advantages to uh, modern digital photography because back in the film days, if uh, you know you, you you carried around a lead-lined bag, and that was for putting your film in, and uh, basically you would be taken off to the side while the uh, well it wasn't TSA at that point, but uh, you know security would want to hand check that lead lined bag. But because of the fact that uh, film uh, can get fogged by some of these uh, uh, x-ray units. So you can't, you know, you don't have that problem anymore with digital. Exactly. Um, you, if you forget your lead lined bag, say bye bye to your pictures. Now, so one other alternative is um, you may, maybe you want to travel light. Um, maybe you just want to take your camera and maybe one other lens with you. Um, if you get something like the, uh, the Black Rabbit strap, you know, you, like I showed you, you can easily carry, carry on your camera and you can get a lens bag to carry that extra lens. And you know, this is like a pouch that you know, hangs off your belt. Okay, you look like Batman with his utility belt, but still, you know, that's way, way more convenient than, than even any photo bag or backpack. So that's one route that you might consider taking as well. Memory cards. The rule of thumb is you can never have too many memory cards. The second rule of thumb is you'll, you'll run out of memory exactly the time when you need it. Yeah. <sighs> memory is cheap, so you can really load up on these suckers. I mean, was it Costco? You can get you know the, the 8 gig SD card for like 20 bucks or something. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculously cheap. Um, uh, Co Costco, Fry's, um, uh, uh, Newegg, <laughs> all sorts of places online. Amazon memory is memory is ridiculously cheap, and you should definitely get as much as you can because you will need it. Um, and last it, night, and I, it doesn't take up much space. Exactly. Um, last night, I shot uh, something like fifteen hundred pictures at Masquerade, and. Believe me, I had, I had my bandolier of memory cards and I was all set. Another alternative 
is a photo storage tank. And you may want one of these even if you get a ton of memory cards because these are excellent for backing up your pictures because memory cards these days are very robust, but still every once in a blue moon you get a, a memory card failure. So basically what this is, it's, it's basically a hard drive with a memory slot in it. You stick the card in, it'll suck all the pictures off of it and copy them onto its built-in hard drive. So that way you have the copy that's still on your memory card as well as the copy that's on on your little photo storage tank. And also, in a, and if you happen to have your laptop with you and you also load your memory card onto your laptop, then you have three copies of, of, the, of your pictures. Redundancy is good. Yes, redundancy is, is, is key. And uh, these, we've got a question here. Question. Is there a way to take the pictures from that thing onto the laptop? Yes, um, you plug it in via USB and, it'll, and you can transfer the photos off. It's also a great way of, you know, giving your photos to your friends. You can, you know, you can have them, hand them your little memory, your storage tank, they can copy off of it, or they can put their memory cards into it and you can copy their photos. Okay, we've got another question here. Question. What size is the They come in, in many uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, Capacity. Yeah, uh, um, that's nice. They come in, men, in in many different capacities. Um, price varies. I've, uh, you can get a 250 gig one for maybe what, $200. Um, they're they're not cheap, but they're definitely um, useful. So they are you know, going to be coming down in price. They are. Um, hard drive technology just keeps getting cheaper, and faster, more, better. Uh, you can also use this with your modern day digital video camera. Not the kind that I've got, which still uses tape, but the, uh, the current, like this little camera over here, uh, that uses those same little SD cards. And uh, you can just snarf the video onto this. Some of them are, are relatively simple, like this one on the screen, it's the Wolverine. It basically copies pictures, does nothing else. It only has a, a little tiny LCD screen on it that, you know, that basically gives you a, a basic readout. But you also have some that have really nice uh, LCD screens on them, which, you could, which also are helpful because you can use them to review your pictures because this screen is a lot bigger than the little screen. The odds are that this screen is a lot bigger than that little LCD screen on the back of your camera. So I'm going to go into one of my things here. Yes, I don't know if you can see that or not, but Sorry, see, you, you can um, you can review your pictures. So these have another function where you can actually. If you don't happen to have your laptop with you, but you want to be able to um, you know, review your pictures easily, you can use one of these guys. So they really have multiple uh, functions. And you know, all the gear that I've got up here, you know, feel free to, after the talk, come up and, and fondle it or <laughs> whatever, or ask questions. The future. We talked about point and shoots, and we talked about DSLRs. Point and shoots have the advantage that they're small. Um, they have the disadvantage that they have typically have really small sensors, less you know, less capable lenses, less features. DSLRs are fantastically versatile. You can you, you can use remote, you can use flashes with them. You can use all sorts of different lenses, but they're big. Even even the the, the newer the modern ones, they're still a lot bigger than a point and shoot. So. A really exciting thing is happening in photography nowadays. There's a third category of cameras that, are, that is rapidly emerging, and this is called micro four thirds. And what this is, is like a point and shoot, it's really small. Uh, this is the Olympus EP1, or I think it's the EP2, I forget which one. Um, it's really small, but they have bigger sensors than your typical point and shoot and they have interchangeable lenses. So really, it's the best of both worlds. The only problem with them is that they're still a bit pricey. Um, I think the Olympus is $800, $900, but that's bound to change, so definitely keep your eye on Micro Four Thirds. It is a fantastic format. It's getting a lot of traction. Um, it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Name that anime. Okay, over there. Yes, you. Got it in one.
renting. Again, um, stuff like this lens of doom, it costs you know, basically my entire salary for the month. Um, so, you know, if you can't buy, rent. It's great for those special occasions. So like, you know, let's say it's your, your, your sister's first masquerade. You wanna take some awesome pictures of them doing their performance. Um, you can rent, um, rent gear, you know, rent the lens of doom for that. It's also great for trying before you buy. Let's say you've got a point and shoot and you wanna make the jump to DSLR. Well, you know, there's Canon, there's Nikon, there's Sony, there's all sorts of, sorts of different brands. And once you buy into a brand, you're into that brand for life. Um, Canon cameras can only be used with Canon lenses, uh, you know, to their fullest capacity. Same with Nikon and Sony. So really, you want to pick the camera that suits you. And you know, they all have different physical feels to them. They have you know different user interfaces, the menuing system. Some people like the Canon way of doing things. Some people like the Nikon way. Now, if you have a really good Photoshop uh, photo st uh, store in your town, you can go in, and, and I'm sure that they'd let you check out their gear. But you know, maybe maybe they don't have the the widest selection. Cough, so, Sammy's cough. Yeah. <laughs> so, renting gear is a great way of, of uh, you know trying before you buy, and if you end up not liking it, you're not you know you're not stuck into the system. And it's not as expensive as it sounds. Um, this lens here, I think, cost me um, a total of $99 to rent for a one-week period. That's including insurance, so um, the thing can be practically run over by a train and I wouldn't be liable for it. Um, it includes return shipping. It's really easy. They send you a, a, a UPS label. You basically slap it back on the box that it came in, drop it off. It's as simple as that, easy peasy. Um, and the company that I found that I really, really like is LensRentals.com. They have a ridiculously huge selection of gear. All the major camera manufacturers let all sorts of lenses, including weird lenses like you know, tilt shift lenses, lens babies, all sorts of really bizarre things. They have lighting kits, they've got reflectors, they've got um, studio lighting, they've got uh, video cameras, they've got sound equipment. They've got a ridiculously huge, I mean, I'd, I'd love to see these guys warehouse one of these days. And their staff is extremely knowledgeable um, and really, they, they take customer service to a new level. I've asked really weird, obscure questions at two o'clock in the morning. I've gotten responses within, within 30 minutes. These guys, these guys know customer service, they, and they know their stuff. Um, they, they're all professional photographers. They've shot for many years. They know their gear. Um, and we have this lovely discount code that you can use for 5% off, good through the rest of this month. And that's lensrentals.com. Yes, and uh, you know, we are very lucky. You know, here we are living in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, if you live in Los Angeles or if you live in New York, there are a multitude of these kind of companies. I mean, we love it if you use the, the ones that have been uh, so kind to us, but there are others, just to be fair. However, if you're in the boonies, you know, in, the, uh, in, in what uh, some people call flyover country, uh, Having a company that will actually ship you a lens and then ship you another, you know, another lens, you know, you can ship it back to them uh, is very, very useful. Another thing about the, the physical rental companies, you know, you can, you can rent from like camera shops and stuff. The problem is that they usually uh, impose a deposit on you, you know, sometimes non-refundable. No deposit with lens rentals. Um, they have ins they have ex extremely good insurance cover coverage, so they don't charge you any um, uh, any um, uh, deposit or anything weird like that. So, so if you want to rent some gear for con, they're the people to go to. I mean, these are these are the guys that the pros use, but the prices are within reach of of even um, schmucks like us. So. Definitely check them out. Even if you don't rent from them, their website has a fantastic amount of information. They've got a great blog where they often post, you know, photo tips, um, you know, how tos, that sort of thing. So definitely check them out. Name that anime. Okay. Looks like you're. 
I'll give you a hint. Um, we're kicking it old school here, 80s. There's a, a hand here. Okay. You. you got it, sir. I think that deserves a t-shirt because BGC is one of my favorite series of all time. It's the one that got me into the fandom, so there you go. Now I'm going to talk about a subject that would have gotten me laughed off the stage only a few a year or two ago. Yes, cell what phone. you heard just now going off. Cell phone cameras. It used to be that you, the mere idea of using a cell phone camera is just ridiculous because, let's face it, they were crappy until just recently. But now they're actually getting good. I mean, not a, still a dedicated point and shoot is much better, but the cell phone cameras have now come to a point where they're actually usable and make good, decently good shots. And let's face it, uh, what is the best camera? It's the one that you have with you. And, you know, we usually have our cell phones with us. Um, the new iPhone 4 that just came out has a terrific camera in it. It's just gorgeous pictures. Um, and the latest crop of Android phones, like the HTC Evo that I've got, cameras on these are really fantastic as well. Um, but to get to their full potential, you need a little bit of help. The problem, of course, with a cell phone is that it's small, so it's really easy to jostle around. Um, and again, keep it steady. Um, so I don't know who thought of this idea, but, I wanna, but if I ever meet the guy, I, I want to like, give him a big, big old hug or something because it's this pure genius. Most cell phones nowadays have accelerometers in them. Uh, accelerometers measure uh, acceleration. And what happens when acceleration reaches zero? That means your, your mo motion has stopped. So why not write a program that pull, that checks the phone's accelerometer and only takes the picture when it's at zero? That's a f freaking stroke of genius. <laughs> and um, the iPhone has some great, there's some great software for both iPhone and Android. For the iPhone, there's a fantastic program called Darkroom or Darkroom Pro. Um, again, it's, it, it's, it, it works like the iPhone's built-in camera program, but when you press the button, it won't actually take the picture until it detects that the phone has come to rest. For Android, there's a program called um, Perfect Camera and also Smart Cam. Neither of these are very expensive. I think maybe $5 tops, totally worth it. And, you know, most of us, when we think you're taking a picture, we think about editing, editing a picture, we think, oh, we've got to go back to the PC. Well, the phones nowadays are, are, are getting so powerful that they can actually do some really credi credible editing right in the phone itself. And then you can, you know, directly post it to Flickr or whatever. So it's like a one-stop shop. Um, and for the iPhone, uh, both iPhone and Android have a program called, uh, it's from Adobe, Photoshop Mobile. It's completely free. Um, it has some decent basic editing tools, um, cropping, uh, a little bit of manipulation. But if you want more features like color, color control, um, that sort of thing, you, you have to spend a little bit of money. Again, not a whole lot, maybe $5 or less. And for the iPhone, um, there's some great programs, Photogene and PhotoForge. And for the Android, there's Snap FX, a Pixay, which comes in both a free and a pro version. You can try out the free version with mo most of the features, and if you want the extra stuff, go up to pro. And there's also a um, Photo Enhancer, which also has a, both a free and a, and a paid version. So, you know, only a year, a year or two ago, I would have been laughed off the stage if I even you know mentioned cell phone cameras. Now they're actually becoming very credible. Um, remember the uh, the jet that cra that uh, crashed in the Hudson River. The one of the, some of the first photos uh, of that incident came from an iPhone. So even you know it, it's it's they're very credible um, photo taking devices now. Name the anime. Right here. Got it. Let's do let's do a mug. Okay. Let's go. 
Okay, moving on. Photography etiquette. Um, a lot of people wonder, well, can I take this picture? Can I post this picture? Um, the, us, in photography, there's this concept called, um, well, first of all, I am not a lawyer. I don't even play one on TV. Um, but my understanding is that in, in, in terms of where photography is concerned, there's a concept called expectation of privacy, where basically, even though we're here in a convention center, which is private property, there is still no no real expectation of privacy in that you know we're out among other people we're in the public so anything you can see is fair game photography speaking assuming that you're just using it for personal use you know posting it on your website or whatnot this all changes if you decide to go commercial start selling your images or whatnot and in that case i really cannot advise you you should really consult a lawyer and there are lawyers that specif that specialize in uh, the law as it applies to phot photographers and uh, um, journalists and so forth. I really recommend you contact one of those. Yes, and uh, Will Wheaton's law does apply here. Don't be a dick. Yeah, okay? yeah. I mean, if you see somebody with a, with a you know, wardrobe malfunction, don't be that guy and, and go, hee hee. You know. uh, don't and, be a dick. But basically, if you can see it in normal circumstances, <laughs> Um, it's it's pretty much fair game. Not I mean don't not like a case where you know you're photographing somebody in their hotel room using a zoom lens. That's that's that 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 is does not apply. But you know, well, yeah yeah that's like otaku stalker type stuff. Um, that's like a, a, a perfect blue <laughs> material. Yes. Um, but if you're just you know walking around the convention center, fair game. Um, and of course the polite thing to do is to ask. Yes, um, absolutely. That's what I mean. If by nothing, be if nothing Ask else, first. if nothing else, you know, just do something like maybe hold up your camera and you know put a little questioning look on your face. You know, just something to acknowledge that the person is is you know, the person that you're taking a picture of is a human being. And it's also it's also nice to maybe compliment them on some part of their costume. Hey, that's a cool sword, or you know, whatever. Um, Yes, thank you goes a long way. Yeah. Very good, very good. Can, awesome. Do we have uh, a little bit of swag to give this lovely lady? <laughs> I don't know. I'm, 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 I've, I've, I've. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll at least give her a magnet or two. Yeah, there you go. I hear there's a more possible. Now, now, if you're going to Japan, everything changes. Uh, cosplay photography in Japan is really weird. It's very regimented uh, in that you're not, first of all, in many cases, possibly all cases, uh, when we went to AX Tokyo, we actually had to register ourselves as photographers and we'd get a little uh, camera sticker on our badge. And then also, you cannot just take pictures of people in, you know, anywhere. There are actually designated cosplay uh, photography areas, and, and if you attempt, even attempt to take any pictures outside of that area, it's verboten. So they give you this lovely little symbol, which basically means you're, a, you're an idiot. <laughs> Only a little polite, more polite than that. <laughs> So good ideas in general, read the fine manual. In other words, the manual that came with your camera. Know your camera. Learn its ins and outs. Use the force, Luke. Um, Even if you're dealing with something like this. Only by reading the manual. You know, I've seen so many cases where, oh, that really cool costume uh, walks by. People raise their cameras, but they're sitting there fumbling with their buttons. How do I set this mode, blah, blah, blah. If you know your camera, you'll know exact. Your your fingers will will kind of gravitate automatically towards the right necessary controls. It's like it's like using the force, like I said. Um, practice, 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 practice. Your piano teacher was correct. Practice, practice, practice. Um, go out during you know. It, it, 
If you know, before the big anime expo cosplay spectacular, you know, go to a smaller convention like your anime LAs or your Mikomi Cons or something. Try out your skills, hone your skills. Even non-anime venues, you know, if like there's a lecture in town, you know, and they allow photography, go in there, try and take a picture of you know the person at the at the podium. That would be a great great practice for doing masquerade shots, or just you know wander around. Uh, you take pictures of buildings, flowers, uh, whatnot. Learn your camera, how it works. Learn its settings. Uh, practice with you know your your apertures. That way you, you'll know you know how far back you have to stand in order to get that cool blurring effect in the background. Practice, practice, practice. Don't forget your gear. Um, make a packing list. Stick to it. Organization will set you free. Um, a couple years ago, many years ago, I was. Uh, I think it was the Northern California Cherry Blossom Festival in San Francisco. Um, I had brought my camera, but I would forgotten my camera's battery charger. And you know, most DSLRs, they use these proprietary batteries that you, know, you can't just buy double A's at the grocery store and shove them in. So you know, after the first day or so, I, was, I, I you know, burned down my battery. And there was something I wanted to, really, really wanted to take a picture of the next day. So what? So there I was in the middle of San Francisco. I had to find this Circuit City in this dodgy part of town, and I paid twice the going rate for a battery charger that broke on me six months later. So, don't forget your gear. I won't mention the traffic, the parking, <laughs> finding it in the middle of anyway. Don't do that again. Definitely observe no photo areas. Um, a lot of times they're posted with signs or like, you know, they'll so, say in, you know, the AX, Anime Expo forums or the program guide, you know, uh, no, you know, no, you can take pictures here without flash. You can't take pictures at all here, you know, that sort of thing. Um, observe the, the no photo areas. Or if you're going to be that guy, at least be prepared to face the consequences, which can be stiff. I know somebody who is permanently banned from San Diego Comic Con because they, uh, disobey the rules. So, be prepared, you know, just follow the rules. Yeah. Do you have any questions, Tom? Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to crop, um, you know, cutting out picture, parts of your picture. That way you can, you know, il 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 eliminate things. Like if somebody is making a funny face in the background, you can crop them out. Um, Good, you know, in many cases, a good picture will become a great picture with uh, judicious use of cropping. Take many pictures, which is what I call the machine pistol approach. Basically, shooting a lot and you know, hoping one of them will strike its target. Um, you know, that most cameras, even the cheap point and shoots nowadays, have an auto repeat mode where it'll basically take, take pictures, you know, X seconds, every X seconds. That way, you know, if maybe like two out of three will be like blurry and weird, but that one in the middle will just be perfect. You know, yes. the, the Goldilocks and the Three Bears thing. Yes, uh, back in the day when I was studying photography, when we were doing film, uh, most cameras did not have this as a built-in feature. You had to buy a motor drive. If you were lucky, it came, you know, you, there was a motor drive that came with your cam, you know, that, uh, that you could buy for your camera. And it was a pricey item. We're talking about the same amount as the camera. So the very fact that even this cheap camera here uh, has the ability to shoot uh, multiples is just awesome. And finally, you know, the, the real estate people say it all the time, and it's true for photography as well, location, location, location. Um, scout your area if you can, you know, Go around, look around at you know outside at the photo shoot areas. Find those shady spots where you can you know where you can um, soften the light. Um, and sometimes you know if you sometimes a photographer will find a location and, and set up only to find that a much better location was just a couple feet away. So definitely look around. Be aware of your surroundings. Exactly. Name the anime. Oh, yes. Uh, you over there? And uh, yes, this gentleman over here? And 
You want a hint? Hint. We wave them around on this day. You got it. <laughs> okay, where is the gentleman that I need to deliver to? Where, where, where is he? Uh, I could have gotten that one. <laughs> I, I figured that was too easy. <laughs> That's the name of the man? Yep. Okay, cool. It's an awesome uh, uh, kind of war anime, yeah. It's, it's interesting because it kind of takes the point of view of the, of, of the war journalists. And there's mechs. <laughs> so, summary, in summary, point and shoots generally work well when you're free to walk up close to your subject and your lighting is good, and you can manage your shadows. DSLRs work well when those aren't the conditions. Um, so mostly, uh, you know, sometimes you can get a point and shoot to work indoors if you use the you know steadying tricks. But in certain indoor circumstances, like masquerade, you really need to pull out the big guns. And I think I have one more picture than I have swag. But just for the heck of it, will somebody name the anime? Oh, magnets, yes. Okay, name the right, anime. Right over there, uh, you, yeah, you, you over here. Yes, him. Yeah, yeah. Got it. All right. A pair of magnets for your fridge. Uh, just last and finally, resources. Um, Scott Pel Kelby is a very accomplished phot photographer. He's written a series of three awesome books called The Digital Photography Book, Volume 1, 2, and 3. Um, his books take a more cookbook approach. Rather than um, spouting off about theory and exposures and f-stops and stuff, his books go cover the, you know, you have this situation. How do you, how do you handle it? What settings do you set? It's sort of the cookbook approach, and it's a fantastic series of books. And the pictures are just gorgeous. Even just flipping through the book and looking at the pictures will inspire you to get out there and take pictures. Um, Donald, I think there's some people who would like to uh, have some Q&A time. OK. Uh, I'll just mention that the, he does, Scott Kelby has photo walks. I was just, I was getting to that. Um, yeah, there's a, well, you know, you can't get to it anymore because it's time for questions. <laughs> but, there's one this month, and you can check it out okay. on uh, his website. So, um, Q&A time. Here it is, Worldwide Photo Walk, um, July 24th, which is a Saturday. And go to, go to uh, worldwidephotowalk.com to sign up, completely free. And they have them all across the country. Actually, all across the world. Uh, questions? Oh, uh, you over there. I would start with a, a do you want to go the point and shoot route or the, the DSLR route? Um, I would rent, um, you're, you're not in, you're not uh, wedded to a system yet, so you know, you, Flip a coin, Canon or Nikon. They're both, they're both, um, you know, roughly the same features and performance. So get yourself the the low end for the Canon. That would be like the the Rebel, the Rebel series, the Rebel X, the Rebel TI, the Rebel XS. Be that would be that would be one of them. Um, they're extremely lightweight. They're great entry level DSLR. Um, and rent yourself uh, something on the order of an 18 to 55 lens. That's a good starting lens. And feel free to come up and take a look at the gear uh, here if you if you want afterwards. Uh, more questions? Oh, right over here. What do you think would be a good um, starter uh, point and shoot? A good starter point and shoot. Um, the ca cannons make excellent. Uh, 
point and shoots. They have the, I think, the A1000 series. They're very lightweight. They have image stabilization, which helps uh, somewhat in the um, you know shaky camera department. Um, and they're really inexpensive. And the nice thing about those is that they use uh, regular AA batteries. So mm -hmm. if you're out traveling, you're never stuck very far from power. Yes, and uh, and with the lithium uh, batteries, uh, the, uh, the the lithium AAs. Uh, those are your friends. They, they will stick with you and they will give you a lot of pictures before they have to get thrown out. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have to say that I like the Nikons too. Nikon has a line called Cool Picks. Oh yeah, those are excellent. I think the L, L line is a little bit cheap, but I, is it like the A line that uh, that's a little bit more prosumer? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you guys to get some applause before everybody has left, so let's take an applause break and then people can come up with questions. Thank you, awesome.